Pharmaceutical Processing, in conjunction with Interfex 2017, presents Interfex Live. So, good morning. So, uh, it's uh, going to be relatively informal today. So, what we're going to do is try to get the uh, discussion down, get it finished up so we can have some Q&A, because what do you find in a lot of situations when it's a smaller group like this and it's a focused discussion? Well, you know, the questions from the audience are, are, are key. So with me today is an old friend and colleague, uh, Joe McGinnis. Welcome, Joe. And uh, Joe is uh, Senior Regulatory Compliance Advisor at Johnson & Johnson Corporation. And uh, some of you may rem remember him from a former life. He was at uh, the FDA branch of Parsippany, right? Parsippany. Parsippany. I was going to say Newark. Yeah, it shows my age. When it, it shows my age then. <laughs> Hasn't been Newark in a long time. <laughs> okay, so one of the things we wanted to do, and Joe was with us last year, and Joe was able to give us, you know, from the inside looking out, you know, here's a fellow who worked for FDA for many, many years, and now he's on the inside of corporation. The other thing we wanted to talk about today is, you know, not only from the inside looking out, but what is not changed. I mean, 2017 is relatively new year, new administration, new approach to a lot of things. So a lot of people are thinking what's going to be happening. So I think what, but everybody wants to know what's going to change. We're going to talk about what hasn't changed. All right. Because I think in our industry, that's key. Joe, you want to? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, as Russ mentioned, any questions that you have, please feel free to, to, uh, you know, raise your hand and we'll, we'll take them. Uh, I worked for the FDA for 21 years. I ended as the director of compliance in New Jersey, started off in investigations, was an investigator for six years, and then um, for 15 years was in the compliance branch. Uh, all in New Jersey. I'm a pharmacist by trade, went to Rutgers College of Pharmacy. My older brother is a pharmacist. My oldest brother is a pharmacist. My sister is a pharmacist. My wife is a pharmacist. My brother-in-law is a pharmacist. I'm seeing a trend here, Jeff. There's a little yeah, bit yeah, of a trend. Yeah, okay, yeah. Intimately, yeah, yeah. I have three children. One is in engineering and one is in pre-med. When I went to pharmacy school, it was five years. You know, when Russ started, I think it was four years. I mean, there was a lot less, <laughs> lot less elements in the periodic table, too. Okay, we won't go into that. So now pharmacy school is six years. And I might not be able to get into Rutgers College of Pharmacy this year. The, the statistics that I, I recently read are just astounding. But I did get in in 1981, and uh, it was a great time. I had a couple of great professors. And I started out uh, out of pharmacy school working for Eli Lilly. I worked for them for five years. Then I uh, left. They wanted me to go to Indianapolis. I was pretty s stable in New Jersey. I left and started to manage a small pharmacy in, a, in an affluent area in New Jersey with the thought of buying our own store, and we had the personnel to, to run the store. At that time, uh, Merck bought Medco, and shortly after that, Eli Lilly bought PCS. So the management of the prescription business changed dramatically from a, a cash-based business to a third-party business. And we never did buy that pharmacy. That pharmacy is a dance studio today. And um, maybe that was a good thing. So right then I started with the FDA. My oldest brother had been with the FDA. He ran the Orange Book for about seven years. And he spent 38 years with the government, 25 with the FDA, and then the last 13 with the Department of Defense. So I started my uh, career in New Brunswick. It's a satellite office of, of the New Jersey District office and started doing inspections. Did them for six years, was promoted to the compliance branch, and I absolutely loved every minute working for the FDA. I mean, it's really, really uh, a, a phenomenal job. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the task is to keep good drugs on the market and get bad dr drugs off the market. And, you know, there's that gray area that comes into play. And um, I just loved every as aspect of it. And as the director of compliance, I, everybody, you know, after these presentations, they would say, you know, well, how do you do it? How do you do that job? And I always found it easy. I really did. Because when we looked at a product, if I wasn't comfortable with my own family taking that product, 
whether it was me, my, my kids, my wife, my brothers, if I wasn't comfortable, then we had a problem. So we just looked at the facts, right? These are the facts as they present themselves, and we make a decision on the facts that we have at that time. It was easy. It really was. So Russ mentioned the changing regulatory landscape. Well, what hasn't changed? You're still going to be inspected by the FDA. That's not going to change, right? There's a risk-based approach that CEDAR has in place, and, and sure enough, somebody's going to come out and inspect your facility. And what happens after that inspection? There's a lot of talk about reorganization of the field, right? Right now, there's 20 district offices, there's 20 district directors, there's 20 district compliance branches, right? And there's investigators, about a thousand investigators, maybe a little bit more after the Gadufa hiring, <clears throat> about a thousand distributed throughout the country. It's about 50, maybe 60 in New Jersey. You know, compare that to the number of FBI agents, I think was something like 500 in New Jersey. So, you know, the FDA is, uh, you know, is gonna be around. They regulate 25 cents out of every consumer dollar. And that, that estimate has come down a little bit, but it's still around 25 cents out of every consumer dollar is regulated by the FDA, right? Drugs, devices, food. Food is a huge part. <clears throat> You know, um, even, even you know, strange things like uh, bedpans, right? Um, microwave ovens, you know, all of these things are regulated by the FDA. So it's a, a, a very, um, you know, it's a monumental task to, uh, to keep the consumers in the United States and, and abroad um, safe. And we want safe and effective products. And that's why they name those th the thousand investigators they're consumer safety officers. That's their title, CSOs. We call them investigators. So they go out, and just, I'm just going to take a little bit of time and do a little background, right? Okay. What, what's happening now and what has happened in the past. We have 20 district offices. We do an investigation and an inspection, whether it's a pre-approval inspection or a general GMP inspection. That investigator writes up a report goes to their supervisor, right, the investigator, the supervisor uh, of investigations branch. They review it and determine that it's either going to be NAI, VAI, or OAI, right? Everybody is familiar with that. Um, you can look, by the way, on the FDA uh, uh, internet website and see the statuses of past inspections. Now, under, under the FDA transparency tab, Go to www.fda.gov on the first page in the middle on the bottom. You'll see transparency. Hit that. Navigate to the inspectional database. Click on that, and you can search by firm, by country, um, and, and look at what past inspections have been classified. The inspections that are not listed in that database, and, and there's about a six or nine month lag time in that database, but the inspections that are not listed uh, perhaps have a case pending against them. And those inspections, the facility will not receive a copy of their establishment inspection report because maybe the center is reviewing it at that time or some other information is withholding release of that establishment inspection report. So the supervisor looks at it, NAI, VAI, OAI. All the OAI cases go to the district compliance branch, right? There's 20 set up in the United States. When the inspection report and the exhibits come to the compliance branch, a compliance officer reviews that. The, the firm has 15 days to respond to the 483 observations and the compliance officer takes that response into consideration if the response is received within 15 days and makes a decision. Are we gonna move forward with a case, right? There's administrative um, uh, remedies, regulatory meeting, untitled letter, warning letter, and there's also judicial actions, seizure or injunction. With a seizure or an injunction, um, these are you know, the most uh, you know, highly uh, 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 reviewed cases at all levels. Prior to uh, a seizure, any seizure or any injunction taking place, um, if you read the regulatory pr procedures manual in judicial actions, you'll see the 
um, the steps that are taken. And prior to the closeout of the inspection in a seizure or an injunction case, a pre-assessment call is held. And during that pre-assessment call, in a district office, you'll have the director of compliance, the compliance officer, the investigator, and the investigator supervisor sit during a teleconference with the Office of Chief Counsel, the appropriate center, if it's a drug, it'll be CEDAR, Office of Compliance, and the Office of Enforcement. Those four entities will vote at the end of that telephone call and decide whether to continue to pursue an injunction or a seizure. That's the way it happens today. And it's a, a very, very efficient way of doing it. And it's only been done for about four or five years. And you know, after a while, you, um, you pe become quite savvy on what cases are gonna move forward and, and what cases are not. And the ones that are not, you don't bring forward because in a seizure or an injunction, right? We're, gonna, we're talking about going outside the Department of Health and Human Services, right? We're gonna get a, a, the Department of Justice involved. And those, uh, those cases are, are, are few and far between. Last year, there were four injunctions. How many involved drugs? How many were from CEDAR? Anybody know? One. How many CDRH? One out of four. And there, the other two were food injunctions last year. So, it, it, you know, it, I'm sorry, that was seizures. There were four seizures. There were 17 injunctions last year. I'm sorry, four seizures and 17 injunctions. Um, with the injunctions, there were three CEDAR injunctions last year. And we're talking about fiscal years. Whenever I talk about a year, I don't talk about a calendar year. I talk about August, uh, October 1st to September 30th. So right now we are in fiscal year 18, right? Fiscal, fiscal year uh, 17. In October 1st, you'll begin fiscal year 18. <laughs> Sorry about that. So fiscal year 17 began October 1st of 2016 and so forth. So that's the process right now for a seizure and injunction. For a warning letter, it doesn't, we don't have a pre-assessment call. But the vision is perhaps possibly to have that type of pre-assessment call where the evidence gathered by the investigator is uploaded into a system that the compliance officer in the district and the compliance officer in the center can concurrently review the evidence before the inspection is closed, have a conference call similar to this pre-assessment call and make a decision. Are we going to pursue a warning letter for this firm or not? If you look at the issuance of some of these warning letters, some of them are over a year old. I mean, that's a long time from the date of the inspection, um, you know, especially some of, the, some of the foreign warning letters that are issued, um, they can be quite lengthy. This new way of doing, um, you know, warning letter issuance might come into play. We'll see. So getting back to, uh, you know, how an inspection results in an action, and what regulatory changes might occur. Yeah. Well, every year there's a budget, right? The fiscal year 17 budget is in place, and now they're negotiating the fiscal year 18 budget. If the budget isn't passed by September 30th, sometimes there's a continuing resolution. In my 21 years uh, with the FDA, we had two continuing resolutions where um, employees were furloughed and only uh, a, a skeleton crew remained. The last time, this was a couple of years ago, um, I remained. All the, uh, I should step, step back one second and say that the FDA is composed of civilian employees and commissioned officers. Um, the civilian employees' uh, career uh, is usually uh, 30 years if they, uh, retirement I think is 55 and 30 years of employment. For a commissioned officer, it's 20 years, regardless of age. And I was a commissioned officer, I stayed 21 years, I stayed an extra year, but I could have stayed for 30 years. So all the commissioned officers will remain during a furlough. I think in New Jersey at that time we had seven and we kept maybe 10 civilian employees. Everyone else was furloughed during this continuing resolution period. If that happens, maybe, maybe the employees would be furloughed again, but we'll see. Right now, 
the, the budget is in place and is, is good until September 30th. So we'll see what happens. <clears throat> so just, Joe, let me, let me, so, but there is a budget for the next year. That, that's the question, right? For fiscal year 18, which right. is proposed, right? right? You're seeing some of the administration's proposals that have just recently been, uh, you know, uh, made available. One of the proposal, one of the um, situations in that proposal is a reduction of, I think it was 15 or 16 billion in the Department of Health and Human Services budget. Um, Five billion of that coming from NIH. And I didn't see any specifics about FDA or CDC or the other components of the Health and Human Services, but that's gonna be vetted and we'll see how that works out. Okay. So, but go about Padufa. Why don't we? Yeah, I think that was some. I always forget about that. So, why don't we talk about that a little bit, if we can? How that? What's the what, what's the impact of? You know, the guys are going to be making filings and. Right. Well, Padufa started in 1992. Every five years, you know, there, it, it comes due for uh, a review. So, in '92, in '97, 2002, 2007, 2012, and now 2017. Padufa is up for reinstatement. That's going to be uh, something that you know everyone's going to be watching very carefully. Um, I, I believe talks are being held this week uh, about Padufa, and um, you know it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. Many of the employees down in uh, in the Center for Drugs, uh, you know, are, uh, are 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 concerned, you know, about uh, Padufa. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, uh, you know, remains to be seen. I don't have any information on that, Russ. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, it is a big part of the, um, uh, of the uh, you know, the, the process. And, and one of the things that has come out is, uh, I think the proposal was doubling of application fees. That was what was said in the articles that I read. Mm -hmm. So that still remains to be seen. Okay. <clears throat> so, Joe, I think one of the things that we had talked about a lot, and, and there was some of these collateral things that were going up, and a couple of pieces that came up a couple of times over the past couple of the past day, two days, was the, you know, especially in the serialization, data sharing, data. I so what I did was again, from my standpoint, I, I just said well, I kind of lumped it into like data security or data integrity. So I think one of the things that you know I think. It's what a, I wanted to do is, yeah, let's review that again. It's a hot, hot topic, of course. Um, you know, and, and really it goes back uh, from, from the genesis of this is the application integrity policy, which started uh, as a result of the generic drug scandal back in the 80s. Um, a senator from Utah and a senator from California, Senators Waxman and Hatch, uh, introduced a bill uh, that, that uh, allowed uh, generic drug products on the market back in the late 80s. I think the the amount of generic products was around 15 percent. Today it's about 85 percent. But the Waxman Hatch Act, when that came into play in the 80s, um, there was a it was almost like the California Gold Rush with all of these generic companies submitting applications all at the same time, uh, almost. And there was a lot of problems with a lot of those applications. And during this generic drug scandal. <clears throat> You know, many uh, many people began to um, to to, uh, to to realize that you know the way uh, applications were reviewed needed to be beefed up. This application integrity policy, um, you know, I started with the agency in 1994, shortly after the generic drug scandal. But I still heard all the stories and read all the reports, and the data integrity. Um, uh, issues that we see today is really a, a, a result of the application integrity policy that was, uh, you know, born out of the generic drug scandal. So, you know, in my experience in New Jersey, you know, you, you have the sloppy, stupid types of data integrity issues, right? You have post-it notes, you have a couple of people being able to log in using the same password. Those are sloppy and stupid and need to be corrected. Those are easily corrected. On the other hand of the spectrum, um, though, you know, you have a, uh, a racketeering influenced, a, a RICO Act type of environment, and that reared its ugly head about 10 years ago in a generic drug company in New Jersey. And, um, 
you know, every so often when that happens, the agency takes a keen awareness of that. And after that happened in New Jersey, where six laboratory supervisors went to jail for that, um, the agency uh, started to beef up its training in, in detecting uh, data integrity. I worked down at the Center for Drugs for a couple of months uh, on a detail, and one of the things we looked at was every company that had submitted multiple applications. We wanted to see if they had the physical laboratory equi equipment to see if they could do all the tests that they were claiming that they had done or would be able to do in the future. And that's one of the things that, you know, uh, the agency has the ability to do, and that was a great idea. So um, many uh, consultants have, have uh, you know, been promoting their ability to uh, help uh, in, in w companies in dealing with data integrity, but that's the way I see it. You know, I've been with Johnson and Johnson for two years. Absolutely love working for Johnson and Johnson. I loved working for the FDA. I love working for Johnson and Johnson. And um, you know, we, we I, I see all the notices. I you know I get, I'm on all, all the mailing lists. Um, you, you know, and I, I see all of the uh, publications that come out as well. But I think, Joe, one of the things I think what we were trying, and I think one of the points we were trying to make to our, a lot of the, the folks that we were discussing this with was these data, in, you know, on, on the data integrity, what happens is, is this sloppy and stupid, but what happens, and it's the thing that I find, is that's like that loose thread in your sweater. What that means is that the investigator, that's, that's a hot button with him, it's a red flag, which means that now you're going to get now we're going to drill into that and what happens is it's when you go you know i'm i love fishing and every you know, when you go on a fishing expedition the answer is you're going to catch a lot more than what you anticipated so the, that's the danger is if that precipitates the fishing the fishing trip so the point there is it's not yeah it sounds sloppy and stupid but it's sloppy and stupid and you've made a segue into a catastrophic situation assuming assuming you have done all your preparation, but what you've done now is you precipitated, the, there's no trust. I think that's the big thing. So, you know, it's not just because you want to be neat, clean, and data secure. You also want to show them that you, you know, I got this. I got this under control. Um, I think one of the things that we also wanted to talk about was people are saying that the regulators are the reason we're not got in. That's where innovation's gone in the toilet. Um, if you folks sat through the, uh, we did a continuous manufacturing discussion yesterday. Uh, the, the, the guys from Rutgers were here. In fact, they were going to a meeting to discuss various things with FDA about continuous manufacturing yesterday. But what, what's your take on that? What, what, what's the balance between innovation, Joe, and uh, risk and safety, and where are you at on that one? I just want to back up one second and talk sure. about an investigator that comes to your facility. Right. Could, Go for it, Joe. Could, yeah. could be, could be a, a long-time investigator with a lot of knowledge and a lot of ability. It could be somebody right out of college. Every talk that I have ever given, I mention this, and I mentioned it last year. When an investigator from the FDA comes to your facility, you should help them. You should help them. Because they're going to go to another and do another inspection, and maybe 10 years down the road, they're going to do another inspection. And we want... We want good FDA investigators. Why, right? Why? Why should I help them? They're at my facility. I, I put it this way. God forbid you're in your car and you're on your way home and you get in a car accident, emergency lifted to a, to a hospital and you're giving a prophylactic injection of a, an antibiotic. Who was the FDA investigator in that facility looking at that sterile injectable antibiotic? doing the inspection, making sure that it's safe and effective for the United States consumer. Think about it, right? And it's very easy, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to look the other way and, and, and that way. But when I, when I say that, um, you know, I mean it. I mean it because that's what it's all about. Consumer safety officers are there to protect you. They're there to ask the questions that you can't ask. If there's something wrong with their product, if their kids aren't getting better and they file a, a MedWatch complaint about a product saying that this product isn't working in my child or, they, or the physician switches and it's not being effective and they submit that complaint 
They're asking that consumer safety officer, go ask questions. Go ask questions. That's what they're getting paid for. That's where the tax payer uh, tax dollars are going for that salary to go ask the questions that you and I can't ask. So when I say that, you know, you should help those investigators. You should try to teach them a little bit. You know, teach them if they're young, you know, and they, they get a little bit of knowledge. That's great. And they're human. You're going to see all different types of investigators. Some some people are born investigators. Okay, they're born investigators, and they're going to not stop when they know somebody's perhaps lying to them. And you know that type of individual um, may stay up at their kitchen table until 11 o'clock looking at the data that they collected during the day, going through with a fine tooth comb at everything that they've asked for during that inspection during that day. Others may not. Others may collect it and not, and not do what other investigators do. So there's a wide array of investigators. The investigators that get um, a taste of somebody not uh, being truthful with them, whether it's a uh, uh, two people, you know, logging into, uh, you know, using one password or, or whatnot, that raises the uh, keen awareness of that investigator and may lead to, okay, if they're not truthful with me in this situation, what else are they not truthful with me, you know, in addition to that. So it could snowball. It really could. So that's why I say, you know, out of this whole spectrum of uh, data integrity uh, situations, the sloppy and stupid things we should clean up. There's no reason for it, right? So so the companies have an ability to do that and, and they, they should invest some time, energy, and resources in cleaning up as much as they can. Over here, this is a whole different animal. Right? This is somebody, uh, you know, doing things, uh, substituting uh, vials from passing batches in an HPLC run for failing batches, knowingly doing that, being told to do that. Um, uh, and those situations um, are out there, as evidenced 12 years ago, right about 25 miles from this facility. So, you know, when you run into that, you know, the agency has a, a responsibility to do something about it. They're training their investigators to look for this. Um, they have special training uh, in, in looking at the different uh, laboratory information management systems, how different systems run, what key elements to look for. Um, and, and of course, um, you know, with the passing of the Gadufa Act, <clears throat> right, the thorough and rigor, rigor given to foreign inspections is the same, that's the wording in that act. We want the same thoroughness and rigor in foreign generic drug inspections as the agency gives them in the United States. So Joe, I, I've had the, uh, un, the misfortune a couple of times been working with contractors, larger contractors, and um, they got a 483 that resulted in a warning letter. And again, it was for the same, we'll call it stupid, <clears throat> Because, you know, bottom line, we, we, we were tracking them ourselves. We're our own quality people. But, you know, you can't, you, you know, let's face it. It's not your company. So you're not going to be in every, you're not going to be in their face. And, I mean, ultimately, they manage that. But the point there is it went to a warning letter. So, like, my question was, how the hell did we get there? I mean, it turns out to be sloppy, stupid mistake. How did that wind up with a warning letter? I mean, so obviously the 483 response wasn't adequate. So... What's the scenario there, Joe? Uh, we, uh, we, the FDA keeps files for 10 years. Those files not only include the 43, the establishment inspection report, but what companies write in response to those 43s. In order to go uh, to the warning letter uh, level and then perhaps to the injunction level, um, you know, the firm has to prove that they have uh, lost uh, uh, their ability to be in co control of their manufacturing, f you know, process. So in, in this situation, you know, they got a warning letter looking at the whole file for that company. <clears throat> they met the threshold for a warning letter. Okay, th the threshold, um, you know, after that warning letter for injunction is, is pretty high. You know, I mean, there's a lot of resources that need to be um, expended to, to bring it to the injunction level. And certainly, um, 
after the warning letter, you know, an investigator will be following up on the issues in the 43. Usually four to six months after issuance of the warning letter, the investigator will be back at your facility. And, um, you know, as the director of compliance branch, I used to tell my compliance officers that we, uh, in order to, to pursue a judicial action, the firm has to um, prove that they are either unable or unwilling to come into compliance. Therefore, the district is left with no other choice but to seek help from the court. That's the way I looked at it. So in those big, uh, big cases, sometimes, you know, an investigator will have one injunction case in their whole career. You know, that's, that's how uh, few and far between these are. Um, in those situations, uh, I asked my compliance officers, okay, you know, why is, is this firm continuing to have this problem? Well, I don't know, Joe, but in 2011, they wrote this, that they were gonna do this, this, and this. And they got the same 43 in 2015, and they wrote this, this, and this. What should we do? So sometimes we would call them in for a meeting, and I would list all the inspections, all of the recalls, all the warning letter date, the date of this meeting, and I would say, you know, if ever there was a time to put resources and um, you know, all of your uh, ability to correct these deficiencies, now is the time, because the next meeting will not be held here. There will, will not be another meeting. And usually that would get through to many of the um, uh, firm officials, and if it didn't, and they continued to have those problems, now we've given them a warning letter, we call them in, we give them a face-to-face -face warning. There's no other choice, right? They're not complying, they're gonna hurt somebody. And um, <clears throat> Certainly, uh, when we have that pre-assessment call prior to the investigator leaving the firm the next time, right, the next time that the investigator goes out, it's kind of easy to tell the Office of Chief Counsel, the Center for Drugs, and the Office of Enforcement, hey, you know, this is what we did, this is what we have, and they, this company has proven that they're either unable or unwilling to come into compliance and it leaves us no other choice but to pursue the next level, which in, in that situation would be an injunction. So that's how it works. Now, in the future, you know, we talk about the changing regulatory landscape. I see the future being more efficient for the, for the FDA. <laughs> you, you've all heard about the reorganization of the field. The investigators, um, all of these GDUFA investigators have been hired at a, a higher level than what the FDA has hired investigators uh, in, in prior years. In prior years, FDA investigators could be right out of school and they would be hired on the um, general scale GS5 or seven or nine. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and those GS uh, newly hired employees would move up one level per year until they got to the journeyman level, which was a GS12. To get a GS-13, which is the supervisory level, you have to be either a national um, expert in your field or you have to be a supervisor or move down to the center uh, and be a director. That's how that works. So now for Kadufa, many of the Kadufa hires were hired at GS-12. Some of them were GS-13s and some of them also GS-11s, but they were hired at a higher level and many had experience um, in the industry. And the agency, um, you know, knew that they needed to hire people with expertise, existing expertise, not investigation expertise, but in existing technical ability. And that's what they did. They hired them with existing technical ability. And these GDUFA investigators are now raising their investig investigation skills. So somebody who starts off real low with not that um, much of a technical ability, they need to raise their investigation skills as well as their technical ability. These people already had a high technical ability. So what the agency was doing was sending these newly hired GDUFA um, investigators out with experienced investigators in order to bring them up to uh, a high level pretty quickly. And that's what they did. And back in 2002, Russ, <clears throat> uh, during the summer, some of the meetings that I was involved with, you know, the agency realized that the way um, the investigations branches across the country were operating was not gonna uh, be sufficient in the future. And what I mean by that 
is the 20 district office geographical model was uh, not going to be appropriate because the, the level of technology was increasing so rapidly that they needed more expertise in fields. And certainly in 2002, when the human genome was broken and, and gene therapy started to be talked about more and more, um, you know, th this was fuel for the fodder, so to speak. And now we have the field realignment <clears throat> that is upon us. And if you read the Federal Register notice just the other day, you saw that effective March 17th, there are no more regional directors in the FDA, right? Those 20 district offices used to report to five regional offices who reported to headquarters, ORA headquarters down, down in Silver Spring. Well, those five regional offices are no longer gonna be um, you know, used. And what's gonna happen is <clears throat> The 20 district offices are going to be, all employees will be realigned programmatically, okay? You're going to have um, investigators, compliance officers that are drug specialists. All they do, all their work is drugs. Device specialists, all they concentrate on is devices. Food specialists, all they concentrate on is food. And now, even today, as of today, you could have one investigator do a food inspection last week and do a pre-approval generic drug inspection this week, as of today. In the future, that's not going to happen. You're going to have a line authority from investigator to supervisory investigator to compliance officer to center compliance officer, all on the same page. And this is where I was getting at what, how the future is going to be more efficient for the FDA. And all of, they, all of those people that I mentioned can look at the evidence collected concurrently. And once the agency starts with their new uh, e-inspect, I don't know if you've heard of e-inspect, but right now they use Turbo EIR. You've heard of Turbo EIR, it's been around around 10 or 15 years. But e-inspect gives the investigator the ability to upload documents on site. And those documents are gonna be logged into the case management system commonly referred to CMS, which the agency uses to track cases. In the, in the past, the agency had the FACTS database, the Field Accomplishment and Case Tracking System. FACTS is being phased out. The Case Management System, CMS, is in place right now as we speak, and, and I believe the future is to have e-inspect also um, being utilized by the investigators. Yes. I see many import alerts from India and other places. Um, in terms of getting back to business, again, to get rid of the import alert, how long it takes in terms of expectation from FDA? Every situation is different. There's different pieces of information in every case. Some of the information you may not know that the agency has. Ah. <laughs> All right, thanks. You know, I, I, was, I was kidding around before when I told you about my family being in the pharmacy business, you know, and, you know, word, word of mouth on, on, on products, you know, if, there, if, if, if my brother had opened up a bottle and there was, uh, f you know, fragmentation time after time after time in this one uh, company's uh, product, you know, he might jokingly say to me, hey, you know, what about this? Every time I open those that, that bottle, I, I, all the tablets are always broken. There's a friability issue, right? That's what he was telling me. And, um, you know, after my presentations, um, when I was with the agency, I would always, you know, put my contact information up on the board. And, you know, I would say, if, if, you, if you know something, if you're a consultant and you run into a situation and you think somebody's going to get hurt, right? Well, that person could be related to you that's going to get hurt. Think about it that way. Let me know. Let me know that you want me to go look at this product, this lot, you know, made at this facility. I don't want to know who you are. I just want to help people and make sure that nobody gets hurt. So I would put that up and, uh, and sure enough, you know, you would get anonymous letters and, and things like that. Hi, Joe. Um, I'm also a clinical pharmacist uh, by training. What school? Uh, I went to, I'm, I've been in, um, 
I've done my training in Boston, so yeah, I stayed there for a couple of years. Massachusetts College yeah. of Pharmacy? Yeah, yeah. That's, my sister went to that. Oh, yeah. Pharmacy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There's a few schools. It's like St. John's, uh, Rutgers, and then... But you, you were MCP? Yes, I'm okay. MCP. Um, my question... Yeah, we'll get that. Uh, my question is about um, inspection audits. Um, in terms of uh, these districts, I've noticed that um, the centers have really changed their um, internal structure over the years um, in regards to there's like a pre-approval branch and then there's a separate compliance branch. Um, they call it like the carrot and the stick. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. And I have another question sure. too after that. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the regulatory filing, uh, they, you know, there used to be trucks of like just paperwork um, being sent to the FDA for, um, you know, approvals. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, electronic filing, if you could elaborate on, you know, the changes or the advance, um, the, um, some of the benefits of just electronic filing, um, I think uh, that would help I, a lot of people. Here. I think in, in general, we're seeing a lot more. Uh, yeah. Electronic, you know, even requests by investigators for data electronically, you know, I, I want to see all your complaints and I want them electronically. I want a thumb drive or a disk or something that I can bring it back to my office and tell. We're seeing, we're starting to see more of that. And, you know, you know, I mean, that's just the way technology is increasing the ability to look at more and more things. And computerized abbreviated NDAs, you know, are common now, you know, instead of the trailer filled with paper, it's couple of discs and it makes it easier on a reviewer it's more efficient it's more effective my, I mean my my children I went my, my kids um, are 21 19 and 14 when my 21 year old was uh, was in school uh, in high school we went to a seminar and the professor uh, it, all the parents of all the uh, freshmen were out in the audience and the professor says if you're under 24 raise your hand. And none of the parents raised their hand. We were all over 24. And he said, all of you guys out there, you're digital immigrants. Your kids are digital natives. And when he said that, I said to myself, man, that he is right on. You know, so this age, this new age of technology, you'd be foolish not to try to, you know, implement the, the efficiencies that are available to you. Um, in terms of uh, e even like in the device world with the um, MDRs, the medical device reports, all submitted electronically. There's a transaction database that the Center for D Devices has. All of those uh, uh, device reports come in electronically. It's great. It helps. I don't know if that helped your... Yeah, but I, I think we want to get to the carrot and the stick question, don't we? Yeah. Carrot and a stick has always been around. I mean, it's always been that way. Even back when... Uh, you know, uh, prior, you know, 10 years ago, the pre-approval division um, <clears throat> and the foreign inspection review division in CEDAR was here and the domestic, um, you know, uh, domestic office of manufacturing quality, if you will, would be here and they reported up through the office of compliance director. So um, it's named a little bit differently. They call it the carrot and the stick. The carrot is the, you know, the pre-approval side of things and the, the stick is the compliance side of things. But um, for all intents and purposes, there's different divisions, but the way I see it, it's kind of basically the same. Just one thing to keep in mind. Uh, there's a few of you guys out there in the audience that I know come from the CMC side, not the clinical side. Hot tip, priority reviews, fast to market, bottom line is stability studies are incompressible 12 months takes 12 months to make a tablet it takes 12 months it's time you want to start the technologies you have to invest in technologies a priority review is only as good as you get the product out there and I think you know we used to say that people in the clinical area thought the stuff grew on a bush well it don't and the answer to that is you got to give time for that to happen doesn't matter if you get 17 CMOs working on it something to remember and that rush to market creates sometimes the problems none of it's deceitful but that's let's face it when you're trying to put this much together in a time frame that's impossible that's when it starts to go wrong okay is there any other questions all right joe thanks again Thank appreciate you. it right thanks. pharmaceutical processing in conjunction with interfex 2017 presents interfex live 